This is Inspirational Radio. Join me, Karen Rudd, a therapeutic body worker for physical therapy and the host of the Wellness in You show that airs every Tuesday afternoon from 3 or 5 to 4, right here on Inspirational Radio 730 on the AM bandwidth, Radio Trinidad. See and hear us live in HD or high definition by visiting www.inspirationalradio730.co.tt. If you'd like to book an appointment for physical therapy or be a guest on the show in the area of health, fitness, or wellness, please call Karen Rudd at 868-301-4500 or visit the website to www.karenrudd.com k-a-r-y-n-r-u-d-d.com for more information tune in to the wellness and you show every tuesday afternoon from three or five to four right here on inspirational radio 730 on the am bandwidth radio trinidad i'm karen rudd the host of the wellness and you show and a therapeutic body worker of physical therapy to book an appointment for physical therapy or to be a guest on the show call 868-301-4500 a very good afternoon to you, Trinidad. Good afternoon, Tobago. Good afternoon, Caribbean and South America. And to those of you on the World Wide Web, I'm Karen Rudd, the host of the Wellness and News Show. And you know that you can find us. You can tune in to, if you would like to go to a computer, you can tune into www.inspirationalradio730.co.tt. That is inspirationalradio. inspirationalradio 730 dot co dot tt that way you can see us and hear us live right here at radio trinidad in the studio and if you want more information about the services that i offer i'm a massage therapist a u.s trained and certified massage therapist reflexologist craniosacral therapist certified infant touch and massage instructor and an equine or horse sports massage therapist as well among other modalities if you'd like more information about any of the modalities that I offer for strains, sprains, bulging discs, slipped discs, and a number of foot, leg, and back problems, and neck problems and various issues within the musculoskeletal aspect of the body, you can give me a call at 301-4500. That is area code 868-301-4500. If you'd like more information about the Wellness and News Show and the services that are offered, uh, through bodywork, you can go to www.karenrudd.com. That is K A R Y N R U D D dot com. www.karenrudd.com. So it's uh, this Tuesday, the 2nd of July, and I have a very, very special guest this afternoon in the studio. Those of you who can see us and hear us live, you will know who is here with me. She was at the Diabetes uh, 23rd Symposium and uh, did a presentation. And unfortunately, I had to miss her presentation, so I've asked if she could please repeat some of what she said at the symposium for us. And so without further ado, I've got a Dr. Sonia Roach Barker, who is a family practitioner with us, and her presentation that she did at the 23rd Symposium was all about the challenges of diabetes and menopause. So please tune in, ask your friends, family, and so on to tune in, and it's lots of great information that will be shared within this time given until 4 this afternoon. Of course, at a certain point, we will open up the phone lines and have you call in and take the opportunity to ask Dr. Roach some questions. I know some of you got really excited when you heard that Dr. Roach is going to be here today on the Wellness and You Show. And for some of you, she is your medical doctor as well. So you get the opportunity to view and hear and absorb and then call in with questions when we open up the phone lines. So without further ado, Dr. Sonia Roach Barker, good afternoon. Good Welcome afternoon. to the Wellness and You Show. Thank you for Karen for asking me. Uh, um, this is my rest day. So I really had to like you very much to say yes. Um, yes, can you hear me now better? <laughs> right. As I said, today is my rest day. So I think it was because I, Karen was very appealing that I said yes. And also the Diabetes Association is one of my pet um, things, you know. Really? So that um, I've been a life member. I've been a founding member of the Diabetes Association. So therefore, I couldn't say no when they asked me. Right. But we feel very honored, honored and privileged that you took the time out of your schedule, even on your rest day, to come here and speak with us and inform us and educate us and enlighten us and motivate and inspire us. 
all in one? Well, I don't know what I'm going to do because um, I'm sitting down and thinking, what am I going to tell them? Because to me, everybody has heard it all before, and um, I wonder what new message can I bring? And I realize you don't have to bring a new message. You just have to keep saying the same old things over and over. Correct. Mm -hmm. You know, Dr. Mm -hmm. Dr. Roach, since um, the Diabetes Association of Trinidad and Tobago approached me last month, to come on to the Wellness and You show. Subsequently, they've been on Hardline and they've been on other frequencies here within Guardian Media. And I was informed today by the president of the Diabetes Association of Trinidad and Tobago, Mrs. Zobida Ragbir Singh, that since all of this has been taking place in, in the form of media, in the area of media, that they've gotten great responses from people in reference to diabetes and diabetes awareness. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing how many people still do not know some, some of the signs and symptoms of diabetes mm -hmm. and that they may be pre-diabetic or that they may be diabe diabetic because they have not been tested. That's just the point. Yeah. yeah. So if you can, as you said, mm -hmm. you know, and tell us again what you know about it and inform us and educate us and especially in terms of, as you mentioned, diabetes and menopause. Okay. So you have the floor, so, Dr. Dr. Roach. <laughs> all right. If you start at the baseline, diabetes is really a complicated disease because it's not just one disease. It is really like, mo like type 1 is something completely different from type 2. The one that we are focusing a lot on now is type 2 because that is what 99% of diabetics fall into. Type 1, for all of those that don't um, remember about it, it's insulin-dependent diabetes, the one that they used to call juvenile diabetes, and that's the one that we're going to be having the camp about later. That is the one that comes on to little children, infants. It's something that comes on acutely, and thank God we're not seeing many people with that anymore because it's a devastating disease where your pancreas stops producing insulin and you become completely insulin diabetic. And without insulin, you can die. These are the young ones, and it seems to be an autoimmune disease. Now we go to the second one, which is the one that almost everybody now is talking about. This is type 2 diabetes, which is the one that used to be for old people. But now we're going into schools, and we're going into even primary schools, and we're finding children with type 2 diabetes. This is diabetes that is non-insulin dependent because the body is producing insulin, but something happens called insulin resistance, where we can't use the insulin even though our pancreas is still producing the insulin. Dr. Roach, could you explain to everyone exactly what insulin resistance is? Well, it's just like this. It, it, it's as if somebody gives you something and they're trying to tell you to do something and because you are all hardened as they say in the West Indies, you refuse to listen. So it's something like that. Here is the pancreas with the beta cells producing this hormone called insulin which is very important for moving the sugar between w what we eat and into our tissues using that sugar for energy. Into the cells. Into the cells. Now, what is happening is that all of a sudden something happens inside the body that prevents the body from recognizing this insulin and it refuses to use the insulin for what it is made for. So we call it insulin resistance. So what tends to happen then is sugar builds up, builds up more and more in the blood because the insulin that is there cannot work to push it into the tissues for energy. So something um, starts that we call glucotoxicity because when the glucose builds up too high it begins to then become toxic to different cells in our body as you know and this is why diabetes is such a scourge because the glucose becomes your enemy rather than your friend so that's insulin resistance so how does this insulin resistance come about is very we don't know enough about it to, to really tell you everything. That was my next and there question. Is a lot of research going on exactly what's happening, but it's a what they call a heterogeneous type of thing. You know, there is many things are happening. One, it's a gene that seems to be in certain families which predispose certain families towards becoming insulin resistant. Secondly, 
it's being obese and sex and sedentary. Because if you're obese, things happen then with the fat build up in the body and with the lack of use of, of all the different things that, that we use for energy, which causes the insulin not to be able to act. So therefore you find that risk factors for insulin resistance is obesity with this gene that we're talking about, certain races, certain ethnic groups, which of course will have the gene, Afro um, and Indian people in Trinidad have the gene, which is very strange because in the areas of origin, in the countries of origin, they, nev they weren't diabetic. But coming across to the West and becoming westernized and sedentary, the gene now begins to express itself. So you find people becoming diabetic now, where if you go back perhaps to the tribes that they belong to long years ago, you wouldn't have found diabetes. It is very interesting, very complicated. So would you say it's mostly lifestyle that can bring on someone, bring someone to, to develop type 2 diabetes, even though they may have it, be predisposed because it's in the genes? Exactly. This is what somebody asked me just before we came in here. He said, um, suppose I have the gene and I really do everything right, eat right, exercise right, keep my, my weight within check, do everything right. Can I become diabetic? And I said to him, amazingly, you will have the diabetes gene within you, but you may not express it at all in your lifetime. You may be lucky enough not to show that you're a diabetic, but there's always that sort of thing simmering underneath in your particular family, in your particular heritage. So th this brings us to the point of treatment of type 2 diabetes. First line treatment really is lifestyle. And this is why the chronic, um, the, the, the people in WHO, the public health people, are pushing for lifestyle changes, lifestyle changes, because they have recognized that we have predisposition within our population towards this kind of disease. So therefore, if we can do something about making people more healthy, we will delay the time when diabetes will show itself. Because the way diabetes type 2 goes, it takes years. As you remember, you said pre-diabetes. Somebody will be there simmering, and it takes four to seven years before the diagnosis is made. So the day when the doctor tells you you're diabetic, the disease has been going on in your system for maybe four to five to seven years before doing its damage, and you don't even know. So then, Dr. Roach, would you say that unless a person on an annual basis gets, that person would go and have their blood work done mm -hmm. annually, and only that way they could start to find out that they may be pre-diabetic or predisposed to developing diabetes depending on their blood sugar, fasting, okay. testing, how that is done. If a person in lieu of that, if a person has done no testing over the years at all, mm -hmm. does not know that he or she may be pre-diabetic, what are some of the what predisposes a person? We talked about the genes. Mm -hmm. We talked about a waistline of over 35 inches. That's right. That's one of the things we, we, we didn't mention really, but yes. Mm -hmm. We talked about, well, I, sh I shouldn't say we talked about because I also interviewed Dr. Um, Dr. Singh. Yes. Dr. Neil Singh. And he told you these things. Yes, yes. He's been interviewed twice here at the Wellness and You show. And it's really, really, it was very informative information. And what blew my mind was that he stated that Trinidad and Tobago is number three in the world now for obesity and that there are 200,000 people with type 2 diabetes and 1,000 with type 1. And so he mentioned being over a waistline of over 35 inches. What's the age again? I don't remember the age, really. He has figures. I'm not a good figures okay. person. But, I mean, for instance, when you get to age 50, it's a higher incidence. I mean, you're at you're a higher risk. We know that, and especially women over 50. But the age is getting less and less because what we're finding is children now, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the children, and these aren't necessarily type 1 Diabet mm -hmm. di diabetics, these Not are type 2. These are type 2, so which is a startling thing. In the type 2 diabetes or diabetic children, we're seeing from what age? What age are we seeing? 
I don't know the youngest age, but I know that Professor Tilak Singh and um, Mrs. Batson, a nutritionist, had been doing some research going into elementary schools, and they found people in primary schools. So mm. that means that we're finding people under 11. So this is a startling thing again. But you were asking, what then? What can you do? Because in truth and in fact, with what knowledge we have now, all we can do is test the blood. In testing the blood, we, the diagnosis is made if there are certain figures, you know, that you're above certain figures. And Dr. Singh would have told you about those. We, if you're pre-diabetic, then you, when you do your fasting blood sugar, which means you would have fasted about, say, eight hours, four to eight hours, done your blood sugar then. And if you come um, under 100, you're, you're pretty safe, 100 milligrams per cent then of sugar. If you're between 100, 110, maybe up to 125, that's where we have you in that gray area where you have to be looking very carefully into what you're doing because we call that impaired fasting glucose. If you're above 125 when you're fasting, usually we think you may be diabetic. You most likely are diabetic. There's another test we do called the hemoglobin A1C, and if you're above 6.7%, you definitely are diabetic, we think, if you're fasting. If you're not fasting, then it's difficult because if you've eaten something, we're not sure how much of that is what you've eaten. So therefore, we do something called the two-hour postprandial, which Dr. Singh would yes, have told Dr. you Singh about. Yes, Dr. Singh spoke about that. And yes. it's the first time I ever heard about that. Yeah, and it, we don't do much of it. But in fact, that's the first thing that you pick up. That's called, that what's, what's the name of that test again? Two-hour postprandial, meaning you've eaten a certain amount of maybe sugary Maybe In fact, if you eat a test meal of so much sugar or if you've eaten an ordinary meal and you wait two hours for that meal to digest and then you do your blood. If you pick up certain things in it, if you have a blood sugar then of above, say 125, you start to worry. If it's above 140, definitely you're diabetic. So that's the first change. Remember I told you 47 years it takes to develop. That's the first change that happens. A little bit later, maybe a year or so later, the fasting goes strange because at that time, the fasting is still normal. So you two hours is the first one. But most times, for some strange reason, we do not send you for the two-hour post We send you for the fasting. That's interesting. Why? Because of money. Because most times you want to find out about your cholesterol. And the only way you're going to get a good reading of the cholesterol and the lipid profile is fasting. So rather than take two samples of blood, we tell you, okay, do the fasting. But if you want to find out about your diabetic risk, it's the two-hour post prandial that you should be doing. Well, this is a frightening disease, mm -hmm. autoimmune disease, from my point of view, because as mentioned before, both by you and by Dr. Neil Singh, um, that when a person's pre-diabetic, there are no signs or symptoms. No. No signs or symptoms. So by the time the person's having the incessant thirst, mm -hmm. frequency in urination, mm -hmm. what are some of the other symptoms that a person has when they're for sure a diabetic? Well, the itchiness, and as a female, most of the time you get um, this yeast infection in the vagina. What causes the itching, though? I'm curious about that. Well, this is one of you ask very interesting questions. <laughs> because it's Cause I'm very interested in it. <laughs> well, I am not too sure what causes the itching, you know, but I think it has something to do with the, 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 the amount of glucose that is in the, in the tissues, ah. you see, which causes irritation. But really, I may be saying the wrong thing, but I'm not too sure. I know, for instance, in menopause, again you get this itching and this you know real ridiculous feeling feeling totally uncomfortable but some of the symptoms as you say have to do with urination some of the symptoms have to do with infections because for instance if you have um, scratches that don't heal very well and as these rashes in your groin that sort of thing um, because of the urination the thirst and then uh, those are more or less the major things Sometimes you pick it up when you go to the optician and they look at the back of your eye. They can see it at the back of the eye. Mm. They can see changes in the eye. Um, sometimes they send patients to us and say, check this person. We think something is wrong here. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's really frightening because you can lose your eyesight. You yes. can lose your limbs. Yes. So many things can happen. Yes. So I just want to share with everyone that the Diabetes Association of Trinidad and Tobago is having their 13th annual residential camp for children with diabetes organized by the Diabetes Association of Trinidad Tobago otherwise known as DAT, D-A-T-T -T. and this is happening from the 21st to the 28th 
of July of this year. The venue is the University of uh, Southern Caribbean in Maraca, St. Joseph. And the eligibility would be children recently diagnosed with diabetes from ages 7 to 17. And there's a supervision of a doctor or nurse or diabetes educators and social workers. And the registration, the deadline for the registration is July 16th. And there's supposed to be lots of fun and outings, fun trips and educational trips. So parents and guardians who are interested in having their children participate should contact the Diabetes Association of Trinidad and Tobago, 17 to 18 Success Road in Chaguanas. That is the Diabetes Association of Trinidad and Tobago, otherwise known as DAT, D-A-T-T, is located on 17 to 18 Success Road in Chaguanas, and their telephone number to set up an appointment, or if you wish to get more information about this event, you can call 672-0864, 672-0864. So as mentioned, that is the 13th Annual Residential Camp for Children with Diabetes, organized by DAT, or the Diabetes Association of Trinidad and Tobago, and it will be from July 21st to the 28th. And if you want more information, you can call 672-0864 is the, inf- is the phone number to call. All right. So, um, gosh, there's so many things I would like to ask you, Dr. Roach. So let me, let's go back to, because as I mentioned, I missed your presentation. So if you can highlight some more about what you talked about at the 23rd Symposium, that is the challenges of diabetes and menopause. If you can highlight some of that information for us before we we open the phone lines. Okay, right. Well, we were trying to say twin challenge because um, it turns out when I I was asking myself why twin challenge, and then it turns out that menopause is very much like diabetes in a way because some of the symptoms are the same. And suppose you were a woman approaching menopause and at the same time you were becoming diabetic, you might not know the difference. Or suppose you're a diabetic woman in menopause, some of the symptoms would be almost like things that you that bothered you when you became a diabetic. So what I found out in thinking more about it and researching more about it was that when you're a diabetic, you're a woman with diabetes, maybe five years or whatever, and you're feeling pretty good about yourself. Your diabetes is well controlled, everything going fine, and all of a sudden, menopause starts what can happen is everything can go upside down because menopause presents an additional challenge to the body and it makes your diabetes more difficult to control such as because it does all these things because of hormones again remember insulin is a hormone right estrogen is a hormone progestogen is a hormone and in menopause estrogen and progestogen are being taken away from you And what it does, it starts some kind of upheaval with the whole homeostasis in the body and your blood sugar begins to go up because menopause also creates a a, a situation of insulin resistance. So here you are, diabetes, insulin resistant. Then now you're presented with menopause, pre-menopause because you're not too sure what's happening. Your periods begin to maybe get scanty, maybe stop. You're not too sure if it's going to come back again or sometimes the opposite happens where the period comes and will not stop. Heavy, heavy, heavy flow. So here you are going to your gynecologist and you're completely forgetting your diabetes. You're a diabetic who is menopausal. And your doctor tells you, but what is happening? I'm checking and your blood sugar is much higher. Are you eating differently? What are you doing? And you're feeling all the things that happen with menopause. The hot flashes, the night sweats, you're getting up in the bath to go into the bathroom because you you can't keep your urine as well as you used to keep it before because your bladder begins to behave strangely. You begin to get very moody and irritable. 
you begin to feel differently when you're having intercourse if you're married or you have a partner you suddenly find that your vagina is completely different it loses feeling because they think only men can have um, loss of libido and stuff like that but women can have problems too because the lining of the vagina changes it gets thinner it gets drier because the mucus um, secretions get less because of the hormonal changes everything feels differently in fact it can be very painful so you begin to refuse to have anything to do with your husband he thinks something is wrong you begin to get more angry with him and it's all sometimes quite a mess but the thing about it is some women will tell you i don't feel any way different i sometimes i'm asking but in truth and in fact some women have no problems at all except for the fact that the period just stops and then they say thank god i don't have to worry about that anymore but some women have it terribly hard i remember when i was a medical student having to send one to professor boburn because i thought she was mentally ill the way she was getting on she was admitted to the ward and we thought she was a psychiatric patient. She doesn't mind you sharing the story? <laughs> I, she doesn't know who she is. I'm not even going to call her okay. name. It's so long ago for all you know, she's not even here with us anymore. <laughs> and Professor Boburn laughed at me. He said, why don't you do the lady's hormonal um, profile? I said, why, Prof? He said, the woman is menopausal. Give her some Premarin and you'll see what I mean. And it was so true because there is a group of patients who will need to be put on hormone replacement because that will make everything sort of settle again whereas others can do just lifestyle changes things like wearing different clothing you know cooler clothing keeping your bedroom cool using air conditioning judiciously things like that changing how you eat because for instance there are certain foods like say soya products that will help to control all the different symptoms but the message for me, for the diabetic, was this, that you have to be so much more careful now in managing your diabetes if you're entering menopause. You have to be talking to your doctor more often. You have to be measuring your sugar more, more often. Like, for instance, measuring it more than once in a day or um, more often during the week and being more careful then with the medication that you might be taking because you may have to modify the medication to suit the changes that menopause brings. Now, Dr. Roach, I know that there are some women who say, well, I n I've never had any symptoms of menopause. How do I know that I'm menopausal or not? Or if the person goes to the doctor, if they're diabetic and the person goes to the doctor and says, well, why, you know, why the increase in the, in the amount of uh, sugar in the blood and why the reading so off and if the patient is not aware mm -hmm. that they're menopausal mm -hmm. then does the doctor take the initiative and test them to see if they're menopausal well this is the thing because um, not everybody they, experiences you know, all the symptoms of menopause if, if if you're really the family doctor then and you are your, your patient are in tune you realize the age right because menopause doesn't have a time no no special timing it can start from 42 as early as that or it can go on to 58, as late as that. Most the, Meaning most the onset. The onset, yes. And most people are in their 50s in the West Indies that when they become really menopausal. As with diabetes, Why it's is a that? process. Why is that? We don't know. Because That's I, interesting. Because looking back at the, the, the figures again, you realize that in certain countries, I think they say in Asia, women start earlier. They also say that this that diabetes predisposes perhaps to an earlier menopause. I'm not sure because I haven't looked at the figures. As I say, I'm not like Dr. Singh. I'm not very good at <laughs> figures and that sort of thing. But um, in our part of the world, most women are really late, late 40s, early 50s. And some go on to kind of mid 50s, late 50s. And you realize that gives us a very long reproductive life that's right because menopause really is the end of rep reproductive life we say you are postmenopausal if you haven't seen your periods for definitely for say 12 months okay but um some women get a bleed again after that but i must warn you if you get a bleed after you think you've missed your periods for a year you must go to your gynecologist to make sure that there isn't anything other than menopause going on inside the womb. Because by the time the 12 years, 12 months rather, have mm -hmm. passed, mm -hmm. 
one, a female ought to consider herself safe, that she won't get pregnant. Exactly. Yeah, because I know that um, a number of women of advanced age, well, advanced maternal age, mm. someone who gives can give birth, um, let's say in their 40s or 50s, they may think, well, gosh, you know, I've, I've passed that stage, mm -hmm. or they've gone into menopause and it's been just a few months, they haven't seen a period, mm -hmm. and ta-da, <laughs> she's gotten <laughs> pregnant. Yes. So what we're telling everyone, what you're telling everyone, Dr. Roach, is that, uh, that women ought to wait 12 months without seeing a period to consider herself safe we without so. having to get pregnant. Yeah. yeah. But if, even, I mean, the, the point is during that 12 month period, you still, you, you know, you still take precautions. And m mostly it's a dialogue between you and your doctor in a way. You're asking about the diabetes testing and all of that. Remember that you should be going regularly to your doctor, not every month, but at least twice a year. You should have your whole monitoring kit. Because if you're a member of the Diabetes Association, you've learned how to test, you've learned everything about it. So it means you could be at home checking what's happening. So as I say, if you get to the stage where you think that your periods are beginning to stop, beginning to get strange, remember that there's a risk of your diabetes getting a bit out of control because of the hormonal element. So begin to check more regularly. Test yourself, the whole monitoring kits and stuff, a little bit more regularly and if you're not too sure about what's happening talk to your doctor and this is where the the relationship with the doctor is important now dr roach today in today's guardian there was an article from the diabetes association of trinidad and tobago and the talk they talked primarily or the article ra rather focused primarily on children with diabetes yes. and i know that when the president of the diabetic association was here at the station she shared with us and with all the all, all of the audience members that in Canada mm. that there is good nutrition within the cafeterias in Canada for the children mm. and that w the Diabetic Association would like to do the same here in this country. How can that happen here? I don't how can we make that happen I here? I really don't know how we can make it happen if we don't have the will and we don't have the focus. <laughs> And you know, you know, you have to have the, the sort of relationship between the powers that be and the NGOs like the Diabetes Association that means well. As I was waiting for you, I was talking to a gentleman outside and he was saying similar things. Because what I've noticed is that the co he was saying that the cost of food is easier to cook and eat unhealthy than to cook and eat healthy, which is true. And what I would love to see is the is a is a union between the Diabetes Association, the um, Caribbean Food and Nutrition people, the there's something called TANDI, Trinidad and Tobago Association of Nutritionists and Dietitians. So they are the experts then that could give advice. The school nutrition program, because what happens is in order to make yourself break even, if you really want to to pay for these things. We have to find a way of buying healthy, eating healthy, even planting healthy, you see, because the, we have to find a way, the union between the farmers and everything else, the distribution of food, the availability of food, the fast food people even, because there's nothing that says that fast food can't be healthy. So it means everybody sitting around the table and having dialogue and being on the same path what, what is the same path? The one goal, we want our children to be healthy and by extension our nation to be healthy because it's going to be just too expensive to, to, to do what is going to be necessary because diabetes, as I say, has toxicity. Toxicity to our blood vessels, mm -hmm. our micro vessels, our macro vessels, our organs, everything else. You cannot afford it. We're not going to be able to afford what will happen if we don't do the right thing. Do you think that we are already at epidemic proportions here in Trinidad and Tobago with 200,000 people of our population having type 2 diabetes? Undoubtedly, because, I mean, 10 years ago, we were you know, we were kind of um, complacent. I am surprised to see the escalation of everything. And I don't see why we can't sit around a table and sit down and say, yes, we can solve it. It, it, it. To me, it's exciting. I don't see it as a problem. I see it as something that can be done. But looking retrospectively at things that have happened in this country, I can see where it may not ever, ever happen because of the fact that people are selfish. 
people are motivated by self agen self promoting agendas and they cannot see that Trinidad can have win win situations. You want to have your self promoting agenda, it can still happen, but at the same time you can sit down and say, Listen, I'm not going to do it at the cost of something else. I really want to make this point very, very, very um, you know, sincerely without saying that I'm I mean insulting anybody <laughs> or, or touching or you know tr tramping on anybody's toes but Trinidad and the entire Caribbean let us create win-win situations even for those of you who are only operating from a selfish and a little ego position okay well Dr. Roach we are going to take a commercial break and when we come back, we're going to open up the phone lines and have people calling because I know the callers are anxiously waiting to call in. As I mentioned, a number of them are really excited that you're here today and you are the doctor of some of them. So people are, I know they're holding on to the edge of the seats waiting to call in <laughs> to ask questions. So we go to a commercial break now. When we come back, we will continue our conversation with Dr. Sonia Roach Barker, who's here talking to us about diabetes the challenges of diabetes and menopause. We'll be right back. Join me, Karen Rudd, a therapeutic body worker for physical therapy and the host of the Wellness in You show that airs every Tuesday afternoon from 3.05 to 4, right here on Inspirational Radio 730 on the AM bandwidth, Radio Trinidad. See and hear us live in HD or high definition by visiting www.inspirationalradio730.co.tt. If you'd like to book an appointment for physical therapy or be a guest on the show in the area of health, fitness, or wellness, please call Karen Rudd at 860. 8-301-4500 or visit the website www.karenrudd.com k-a-r-y-n-r-u-d-d.com for more information. Welcome back to the Wellness and You show. I am Karen Rudd, the host of the Wellness and You show and my very, very special guest with me here in the studio today is Dr. Sonia Roach Barker who is a family practitioner and uh, she's discussing the challenges of diabetes and menopause. Great information. And before we open up our phone lines, I'd just like to share with you again that the Diabetes Association of Trinidad and Tobago, otherwise known as DAT, D-A-T-T, -T, has its 13th annual residential camp for children with diabetes organized by DAT. And it runs from the 21st to the 28th of July. And the venue is the University of Southern of the Southern Caribbean, Maracas, St. Joseph. And who is eligible for this? Children recently diagnosed with diabetes from ages 7 to 17. And the supervision is done by doctors, nurses, diabetes educators, and the social workers. Registration, the registration deadline is on the 16th of July. And it's supposed to be lots of fun, lots of outings, fun trips, and educational trips. So they're asking parents and guardians that are interested in having their children participate should contact DAT or the Diabetes Association of Trinidad and Tobago at 17 to 18 Success Road, Chaguanas. And the telephone number is 672-0864. 672-0864. All right, so we're going to open up our phone lines now and have you call in and ask questions of uh, Dr. Roach. She's here in the studio with us, and I know some of you are looking forward to calling in to ask her questions. Please feel free to do so now. The number to call is 623-7301. 623-7301 is the number to call here at Radio Trinidad, Inspirational Radio 730 on the AM bandwidth. Six two three seven three zero one. Now, you know, Dr. Roach, I was really, really surprised when I learned of the th how many children now have diabetes in this country, and in particular type 2, as you mentioned. So why is it type 1 is so different? What predisposes someone 
with type 1 diabetes? Why do people why are some people born with type 1 or they're not, they're develop not, it? No, they develop it because they're not born with it. That might be a genetic thing too, but it seems to be a virus and as I said it's an autoimmune um, condition. So it's like an illness then. You you hit with it then. Something okay. happens to you so it's purely accidental. Okay. So thankfully whatever is happening is less. The incidence is less. So we have just about a thousand. And we have our first mm-hmm. call, Dr. Mm-hmm. Roach. Caller, good afternoon. You're on the air. A very good afternoon to you, Karen. Good afternoon, Santa Cruz. How are you today? I'm quite well, thank you. I recognize that voice. <laughs> and um, a very, very <laughs> special good afternoon to the best doctor in the whole big wide world. You always make me feel so good knowing my, you know that. <laughs> my doctor, a doctor, Dr. Sonia Roach. He, and let me hasten to compliment you on that excellent presentation at the symposium about two or three Saturdays ago. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes. And uh, when you touched on um, menopause at the symposium, and uh, every now and again, you would, um, when you make your points, you would throw out some questions to the audience. And um, in your down to earth way, you would ask them, not so, not so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say, you see, that's my down to earth doctor. <laughs> not so, not so. And they would spontaneously corroborate. Yes, they agree with you. And they confirm what you were saying. Yes, yes, that's true, because yes. that's how it is, isn't it? No, no, I have two small questions, Dr. Roach, mm-hmm. in respect of um, diabetes. Now, you say uh, the, um, obesity is a cause of uh, insulin resistance. Right. Now, is there any other cause? And the other question is, for those of us who do not know, will you kindly explain borderline in respect of diabetes? Thank you so very much. And Thank anyway, you. how are your two precious children. Oh, they're very, very well, thank you. And how are yours and your grands and your grand grands? And great, great, great. Yes, you <laughs> I, know. Have, I have one great, great now, you know. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Fantastic. He, he, uh, um, a boy is about six months old. Oh, my dear. Yes, so it's, it's children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, and one great, one great, great, great grand. Yeah. He's not fantastic. And you have one grand. One, oh, you know too much about me. I yeah. have to know. He's letting out your files. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> oh, yes. Remember, don't forget that you are my doctor. Oh, thank you, sir. Right. Okay, thank you for your call. Thank, Thank you. you. The business of insulin resistance, we're not too certain. You see, um, as I say, I, I am not a biochemist, and a lot of work is still being done um, about insulin resistance. Is this resistance to insulin in promoting the uptake of glucose from the cells, as we said? I don't really know exactly what causes it because, as I say, I'm not a biochemist. I'm, I'm not into that sort of thing so deeply. I promise I'll find out more and maybe tell you at another time. But um, that question is, is basic to the, for, um, to, the, to the reason why type 2 diabetes emerges and there are other diseases as well because there are other diseases that are linked to resistance to certain hormonal things and certain chemicals in the body. There's something called the metabolic syndrome, which is where the obesity part of it comes in because syndrome means that you have a number of different symptoms and you'll find obesity, the central abdominal fat distribution, which is what Dr. Singh spoke about when he said the abdominal circumference should be less than a certain amount because what we find is that the fat that that is distributed in that part of the body is bad fat. It's fat that then is not used in any constructive way. It's storage fat that can then become things like atherosclerotic plaque, the high cholesterol, you know, deposition within the vessels, things like that. We have polycystic ovarian syndrome. You hear about that. More women, more young girls, but again tied to obesity. So that everything seems to come back to the fact that if our body is not using up things properly, everything goes wrong. Fat is there for a reason. We need fat for energy. We need fat for warmth. So that if fat is being put aside not to be doing anything good, it then is used up in negative ways, which is the sludge that forms in our blood vessels, which then becomes calcified, becomes plaque, and then that goes on to heart disease, heart attack, 
stroke and all the various things. So in simple terms, without going into great scientific details, in simple terms is this business of cause and effect, this business of balance. So in other words, if you don't use it, it's going to do something wrong. So if you exercise, that's why exercise is so important. If you exercise, you use it up. If you don't exercise, sedentary, you become obese, and then it goes on to the negative part of it. Dr. Neil Singh had stated when he was here last, two weeks ago when he was interviewed, he said movement of muscle gets the insulin to work better. Yes. Movement of muscle, and he mm -hmm. suggests a minimum of 30 minutes. We have another call. Good afternoon, caller. Welcome to the Wellness Good in Your Show. Good afternoon, Dr. Company. <laughs> um, if somebody has, um, well, they can call their womb, mm -hmm. um, they go into pre-menopause, mm -hmm. and they have a type of symptom, is it possible that they could still get the diabetes? Well, you see... Don't get don't get mixed up, you know. If you're menopausal, that doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to get diabetes. If you're going to be diabetic, it's a different matter. If you're a diabetic, if if you have the gene for diabetes, when you get into menopause, it's possible that you have a higher risk of becoming diabetic if you don't look after yourself properly. Now, if you've taken out your womb and you haven't taken out your ovaries, you're not necessarily menopausal, you know. Menopause is tied to the ovaries and not to the womb. This is what we get mixed up with. Menopause comes because the ovaries stop producing the eggs. So it means that if they take out your womb, your period stops, but you're not necessarily in menopause. So this happens to some women that they take out their womb when they may be in their 30s or maybe early 40s, and then late 40s, 50s, they begin having night sweats and hot flashes and begin to feel sick. And that is when they're going into menopause and they haven't realized it because they stopped seeing the period for all that time. We call that surgical menopause, but it's not necessarily the real menopause that we're talking about when you get to into your 50s, which is a natural thing that happens when you lose your eggs, you see? No, remember what I said, that because you're menopausal, that doesn't mean that if you're not a diabetic, you're going to be a diabetic. That doesn't mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that. Okay, but a um, second, a second um, point again. But um, after the surgery, your belly remains really high. Not everybody, but you know, mm -hmm. some people, their belly remains really high. Mm -hmm. Well, you Whether have... Whether or not they have children or not. Uh huh. Well, it, what you're saying is then that before they had the, the, the operation, maybe they had fibroids and that made it high. Yeah. And then after the operation, even though they take out the fibroids, the tummy still remains high. Yeah. Well, if the tummy remains high, it's usually because they have fat. You remember, we were talking about the fat, mm -hmm. the bad fat then, the central abdominal fat <laughs> that we don't want. Mm -hmm. And as a woman, I sympathize with us all. That kind of fat is the hardest fat to move. Uh, even when you diet, your face loses fat, your chin loses fat, your bosom loses fat, but your tummy still remains fat. So we have to work out exercises or something, you know, to, to get that fat okay. down or do um, what the rich people do. And what's Thank that? You you know Thank what you for it, your call, caller. You know what it is. You know your tummy tuck. Yeah. <laughs> the quick fix. <laughs> you know. All right. So Dr. Sonia roach is with us here in studio at Radio Trinidad, Inspirational Radio 730 and the EM Bandwidth. If you'd like to ask her a question, now is a good time. The show ends at just about, just before four. So we have a few minutes left. So now is a good time to call 623-7301. And we have a caller. Good afternoon, caller. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, the raw food gentleman. Oh, good afternoon. Now, I'm Sister Ruth. Yes, sir. Um, I've studied that prosperity uh, eating mm -hmm. is one of the main causes of diabetes, where you're able to overeat mm -hmm. and eat too much sugar, too much protein, too much fats, and all the like. So true, so true. And um, I also study that if you can live mainly with the, the green stuff like watercress, celery, parsley, onions, garlic, and so on, 
you are able to either control or eliminate uh, with a lot of exercise, rigid exercise, because I, 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 I believe that if you and cucumbers and so on, which has a hormone that can help to repair the pancreas and so on, I, I think if people could go diet-wise, uh, they can help themselves with diabetes. Well, this is a message that I think the, the WHO wants to give to the world, that you can prevent a lot of the metabolic things from happening to you from, the, 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 from infancy, if you start teaching your children how to eat better. There is a theory about vegetables and vegetarian diets, but at the same time, there is no bad food. You know, the thing is this, that our body still needs certain nutrients which we cannot get from plants alone. Um, if you want to be totally healthy, you cannot really eat just a total vegetarian diet and not have deficiencies. What we have to learn is how to eat those foods, how to prepare those foods, how to mix those foods. But it is said that the person who is more vegan than, you know, the carnivorous meat-eating person generally can be more healthy than the person who consumes a lot of meat, a lot of protein, and big portions of carbs and fats and that kind of thing. Yeah, I believe also you can get your, your natural protein from seeds, grains, and nuts, such like sesame seeds and sunflower seeds and almonds and so on, uh, you know, that can balance the people who are more on the vegetarian line. Uh, you can get a lot of your stuff that can compare with meat or even higher quality or higher than meat. Yes, you can get some of it, but there's still going to be some B12 deficiencies. Well, yes, you, you can get your B12 maybe by using like bee pollen and kelp and a lot of those things have been B12 too. If you if you start to start to study the area that has B12, you start to use your use other stuff that have B12 because I am doing that. Yeah, what 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 I'm saying is that that there, there does not necessarily mean to be a all or none. The point I'm trying to make to people is that God made all these things for us to use. What we have to learn is what they have how to mix them, how to prepare them, and what to do with them, you see? Because in truth and in fact, no food is really intrinsically bad. It's what you do with the food. But I agree with you that the person who goes your way it, compared to the other person who goes the way opposite from you, your way is more healthy than the other person's. But what I'm trying to tell people is that there is no exclusive way what I would love to see, as Karen said before, and what the Diabetes Association hopes to do, is to bring all the different people together, all the different elements together. We sit around the table and we sit down and we teach people so that the choices can be there. Because there is no one, one way that is perfectly, you know, normal, acceptable, optimal or anything. I, I would understand that, but and I would like to see that done quickly because... The way things are going and running, running away, everybody is going down the, on the wrong track. Well, I think everybody is in agreement with you, especially yes. the Diabetes Association oh, of yes. Trinidad Tobago, because oh, yeah. okay. they had an article in The Guardian today just about changing the diet in the school. So, Caller, we thank you so much for calling in and for your contribution. Okay, thank you. We're running low on time, so we can take one more call. If you call in 623-7301, 623-7301, and we have one more call. Good afternoon, Caller. Welcome to the Wellness and You Show. Good afternoon. I have um, arthritis and some um, sugar, but I find my feet burning me like fire. What do you think causes that? Is this bad circulation? Could you lower the volume of your radio, please? Well, that is the diabetes. Again, the, there's so much to talk about diabetes, the natural history of the disease. If you have had diabetes for a long time, it affects your the the circulation to your nerves, to your to your to to your um feet. A lot of the time to your feet, it's strange, it doesn't affect it as much apparently to the fingers, but it affects, as you said, bad circulation is a, a term that one could use. It affects the way that these nerves are being nourished, and so they begin to give you the wrong information. They begin to tell you that you're on fire when you're not on fire. They begin to tell you that it's paining when you're not paining. So diabetics, yes, have that problem. 
there are one or two tablets that um, your doctor can give you to help you. You must talk to your doctor about that. If you go to the health center, the health center doctor knows what to do. If you go to your private doctor, the private doctor also knows what to do. Well, Dr. Roach, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, it's coming to that time when we have to close the program. What are your clo closing comments quickly? Oh boy, I don't even know what to say. I'm saying that I feel sometimes as if I'm an unlikely vessel because there's so much information, so much to learn. But what I can tell people is if you practice healthy lifestyle for yourself, for your family, and you start to inculcate that in your children, there's so many diseases now, these chronic non-communicable diseases that we can prevent because even though we've been born with the gene for it, it doesn't mean that it has to express itself. Dr. Roach, thank you so much for being with us today on the Wellness and You show. It's been a pleasure having you with us. Very informative and enlightening, of course. And um, at some point in time, again, if you're open and willing, along with that, to come in and share more information with us, because as you said, it's a wealth of information. So thank you so much, Dr. Roach, for being with us today. And to all of you, thank you for tuning in to the Wellness and You Show. Remember, the Wellness and You Show happens every Tuesday afternoon, just after the 3 o'clock news, until 4 in the afternoon. Thank you and good afternoon. <laughs>